panel, you're in the right place. Uh, I'm Jeff Blattner. I'm an uh, adjunct professor here at uh, the law school. Phil Weiser and I teach uh, antitrust this semester. Uh, I've also served in the government in all sorts of uh, uh, capacities. Uh, one disclosure, just so you know, uh, Google is a current client of mine in my consulting practice, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, uh, and of course, the views I express are not necessarily the views of a client or anybody else, maybe not even me. Um, so <laughs> uh, for those of you who haven't had the good fortune of having had antitrust, antitrust is the law of competition. It concerns itself, broadly speaking, with whether transactions or conduct uh, lessens competition. Uh, those transactions could be mergers, acquisitions, things like that. Uh, conduct could be you know, rules of business, all sorts of other kinds of behavior, pricing, things like that. So for, for uh, antitrust lawyers, we tend to view <coughs> data somewhat the same way as a blind person views an elephant. Um, some of us see different things when we look at data. We might see it as a product group, right, product market. Um, there have been mergers where the Federal Trade Commission, I will introduce a former commissioner in a moment, um, where the Federal Trade Commission has, you know, uh, had something to say about mergers where a couple of legacy databases have merged, for example. So it could be a product, it could be a product market. It could be an input for the making of something else. And now, in the world we live in today, data is an input in most things. We talked a little bit on the last panel about the many ways in which data is used in things as disparate as uh, automobiles and uh, television, right? Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, it's also, at least in the mind of, of some, a currency that two-sided businesses, and you know that the social networks and uh, uh, search engines, things like that, are two-sided networks at, at sometimes, sometimes even more than two sides. Well, sometimes they don't charge a price to users. Um, and the question is, is data the price they charge to users? And in that respect, a, a, a currency. So we have a terrific panel. We sort of have a re couple of different reunions going on here. Um, uh, we've got immediately to my left, Karma Giulianelli, who's a partner at Bartlett Beck and was a member of the trial team in the United States versus Microsoft. I was special counsel for information technology and deputy assistant AG during the Microsoft case. We have uh, Nancy uh, uh, Libin. 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 I'll, Libin. I'll my bad. Um, <laughs> who uh, was formerly on uh, Vice President uh, Biden's staff when uh, uh, he was uh, uh, in the Senate, and then you were at the Justice Department uh, in, a, in a key privacy role. You're currently at Davis Wright in Tremaine. Right. Okay. Terrell McSweeney, former FTC commissioner, former Biden staffer. Um, um, why am I keep mentioning Biden? Because when I was Senator Kennedy's chief counsel, Senator Biden was chair of the Judiciary Committee, and he occasionally reminded me that he signed my paychecks. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Uh, uh, Harold just wrapped up a uh, very successful tenure at the Federal Trade Commission and is now a partner uh, at Covington and Burling, a great law firm in Washington, D.C. And last and not least, Christopher John Sprigman is a professor at New York University Law School and co-director of an innovation center there. Like Karma, he was on the Microsoft team. Chris, in an appellate capacity, he was also a professor at the University of Virginia Law School before going to NYU and uh, 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 has a relationship with Sullivan and Cromwell, is that right? No, um, no Simpson Thatcher. Simpson Thatcher, I get them confused. Okay, <laughs> so with that, we will we'll start. And um, let, me, let me start by throwing a question Terrell's way, which is, you, you've left the commission recently. The commission's one of the two main antitrust enforcement agencies. How, does the, how did the commission see data, and what's changed since you left that might prompt one to change, change the way you think about data? Uh, well, thanks for throwing the first question to me, Jeff, and thanks so much for <laughs> Cicel and the prerogative of your for, office. Uh, for having us all here in this terrific panel, and it is kind of, it's like a Microsoft team reunion and a Joe <laughs> Biden reunion. It's kind of great. <laughs> Uh, 
Only at silicon flat irons, right? I guess I also have to disclaim everything I'm about to say, so it's my own view. It's not the view of anybody else, or um, it's going to be my view, though. I'll, I'll, I'll own whatever I, whatever I say here, <laughs> Jeff. Um, so what's changed at the FTC? Um, well, what's interesting about the FTC is that for the first time in its 104-year history, it's entirely reconstituted with five brand new commissioners. So a lot has changed at the leadership level of the FTC. I think it's a little bit soon for us to completely understand where the majority of the commission is going to head on some of these issues because they're currently engaged in a really ambitious project, which is hearings on uh, the state of competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. Um, that sounds broad, it's because it's on literally everything <laughs> that is kind of a hot topic in privacy, cyber, consumer protection, data policy, and antitrust law at the moment. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing, and they've cast a really wide net. I think they should be applauded for that. Um, the leadership of the agency has said, well, we have a really open mind about these issues. Um, we want to be challenged. We want to understand whether our frameworks are keeping pace. And when we, we're sort of soliciting all views. There are also now hundreds of comments in the record before the agency. So, so we don't really know what's going to happen next and how it's going to influence enforcement. I think uh, you did a nice job, Jeff, actually in your opening remarks, highlighting how the agency has handled data issues in the past. And um, I suppose I come down as, as a person who thinks the antitrust frameworks as they currently exist are relatively flexible. The toolkit can be adapted to dynamic changes in the marketplace and changes wrought by technology. Um, you know, you have to be willing to do that, uh, to, to use all the tools in the toolbox and not just focus narrowly on price effects, for example, but focus on innovation and quality effects. Uh, but, but when it comes to data, I think it's really important that antitrust agencies continue to uh, be antitrust agencies, by which I mean focus on the facts, understand the competitive significance of the data that is before them, and evaluate um, that, that accordingly, right? So making generalizations here, I think, is highly problematic. The agency so far has stayed away from that, uh, both agencies, DOJ and, and the FTC. Um, but they have, in certain situations, identified data as a barrier to entry, identified data as a product market, and, and taken action accordingly. So I don't know that we're going to see a different approach, uh, but we may see them build on that approach. So karma, uh, karma is a litigator, top of the food chain in the law. Uh, uh, as you think about what Terrell just uh, described, um, data can be a barrier to entry. Data uh, uh, might be a, a, a currency uh, in, a, in a transaction. How, how, how do you see, you know, when you, if you were putting together a case, uh, if you were thinking about this, what, what do you think the practical consequences are when you're looking at a fact situation to figure out whether there's market power in data, whether there's a narrow market or, or a broad one? Well, I think first you have to think about whether the data is competitively significant. So a large amalgamation of data in and of itself may not be if the, per, if the company does not have exclusive control over the data, for instance. Or if you know, we know that a lot of consumers multi-home and share large amounts of data and information with multiple platforms, multiple companies. So in thinking about the data and barriers to entry, first you have to think about whether it's competitively significant and whether it can be used to entrench power or uh, to, to, for some company to entrench power more than just a currency. So companies try to amalgamate large amounts of data like they do traditional currency, but unlike traditional currency where you can maybe just go to the capital markets, get more money, data can actually be used to entrench power. So first, I would look at uh, building a case based on exclusive control of data, something that gives a company unique access to the data or entrenches their power. And once you have that, of course, you have to look at whether there's an impact to consumers and competition. So, you know, part of the narrative at trial, if you're asking about trial, is not just looking at a company that has power or has control over a lot of data, but how that really impacts competition and consumers. It is not at all clear 
that the control over a lot of data is a bad thing. Could be a bad thing, but it might not be. So you'd have to create that narrative. Thanks. And so Nancy is a privacy lawyer and not an antitrust lawyer, she was one to point out. Um, but, but we just heard the word control used a lot. And in the previous panel, we, we talked about data being non-rivalrous, for example. What do the privacy rules have to say about the terms of trade for the antitrust analysis? Karma talked about somebody having exclusive control of data. Well, what about us? No, I, I think it's, uh, thank you. Um, I think that it's useful to think about how privacy laws and norms uh, set the market conditions for the antitrust analysis, both in part, anyway, because, and Terrell knows this better than I, the FTC is responsible for policing anti-competitive behavior and also for enforcing privacy rules. They're the privacy regulator. And um, I think you know we can tease out a little bit as we go along ways in which uh, um, enforcing uh, the antitrust laws might actually have an unintended uh, adverse consequence on privacy values. Um, and uh, st But starting from the beginning, there are certain privacy laws that uh, may create barriers to entry. Uh, for instance, limits on collection of data. One of the uh, fair information practice principles and something that companies are required to, uh, companies disclose in their privacy policies is the data that they collect and they are required to limit their collection only to the data that they have represented they will collect and to use it only for the purposes for which they have said they will collect that data. Um, there may be prohibitions on sharing data with third parties, um, either contractual or legal. Uh, some companies are under FTC consent uh, orders which may prohibit them from doing that. We heard a little bit in the previous panel about data deletion requirements. Um, that may prevent some companies that hold a lot of data from sharing that data with other companies as well to level the playing field. Um, and then we also have heard a lot from the FTC over the years about data broker regulation, uh, which uh, would <coughs> be a source, data brokers would be a source of data for companies that might not otherwise have the ability to collect data directly from consumers to compete with companies that have tremendous troves of data. And yet data brokers are, um, by, all, uh, by all accounts, one of uh, the biggest violators of, of people's privacy because they do not interact directly with consumers and they are not transparent uh, about their data collection. So the data brokers could be a way to overcome a barrier to entry if, if other firms have more data data brokers could perhaps sell to new entrants? Certainly a source of data, but there are tremendous uh, you know, privacy problems with that um, that one would need to think about as one determines which value way outweighs the other. So, so Chris has been doing some uh, very interesting thinking about uh, the use of data in the uh, online content space. Um, and and uh, from that perspective, what do you think of what we've just been discussing? So from an antitrust perspective, as you said, you know, it's, it's a little bit like the elephant. So what, what part of the world of data are we looking at? So let's look at a particular part, which is the, the world of data as it applies to the creation of new content. And let, let me just point to audiovisual content first, and we can talk about whether this applies anywhere else. But so, um, you know, a decade ago, Netflix was sending you envelopes in the mail. And today, by some accounts, they're the biggest studio in Hollywood. They're incredibly successful. Um, Amazon is following along in their path. And interestingly, both Netflix and Amazon are behind another company that you may never have heard of called MindGeek, which is the dominant company in pornography. Uh, MindGeek, Netflix, and Amazon all do something very similar, although MindGeek does it, I think, even at a larger scale, which is um, collect an incredibly large flow of data from user interactions with their streaming sites. So MindGeek's biggest streaming site is called Pornhub, although they have a number of them. MindGeek also has content production um, uh, properties. And they, they collect a ton of data uh, regarding how people interact with their content. And they analyze that data. And this 
feeds directly into the production of new content. So we got to MindGeek through their funders. We, we got to know them a little bit and we saw how they do what they do. They do a lot of testing about what works within certain genres, what appeals to fans of those genres, and they, they produce more of that content. It is, um, I don't know, happy story or sad story, depending on where you stand on this whole thing, but it's, it's, it's a, a, a bit more advanced version of what Netflix is doing, uh, what Amazon is doing, um, what other um, content providers like Spotify might do in the future. So what does this mean? I think what this means is um, data is potentially going to uh, really rise as a barrier to entry into the production of content. So at least for mainstream content of certain types, maybe we can focus on audiovisual content again. Um, if, if the trends mean anything, and I, I think they probably do, um, not having the data flows that these big incumbents have is gonna make your life more difficult as a content provider. It's gonna make your content production business riskier versus a business that is able to kind of sand off some of the risk using everything that they learn about consumer behavior and consumer interaction. From an antitrust perspective, this doesn't, this doesn't answer the question of what to do, but it, it raises the question of how closely to look at this. So, so in, in, in a very recent and still pending merger, uh, ATT Time Warner Entertainment, uh, ATT and Time Warner said, poor little old us, poor little old AT&T, um, we, we don't have the data to compete with Netflix, and that's why we wanted to combine our two businesses. Um, how, how do you think, anybody on the panel, that kind of analysis should, should play out? You I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still stuck trying to think through all the ways in which your like youth tech use policies are violated by the research you're undertaking on. I'm sorry, on which part? <laughs> no, I was thinking of like you know all the you know don't access porn from your work computer. And oh. <laughs> like, oh. This was just that research, folks. What's happening just research. Over there? Yeah, no, um, we have research assistants. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> did, did, we, we, trust me, we've thought about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But serious question, and I think it's a, it's a very difficult issue. Time Warner, you know, which is a content production company, it's not the cable part, it's the... That's HBO and, right. and CNN, among other... So they Warner said, Studios. you know, we're not, we're not allied with a platform. And so think of the difference. So, you know, it's always been the case. So there was Nielsen, right, and his box office receipts. And Pam Samuelson was mentioning this earlier, and she's absolutely right. There always was this, this data collection mechanism. But it's, it's, it's a toy compared with the data collection mechanism that a digital content platform provides, which is a two-way street. And if you think of, you know, what Netflix is doing, they're logging every interaction. They're using this to construct increasingly fine-grained, um, profiles of their audience, what their audience likes. This helps them make recommendations. This helps them to decide whether to green light projects. Time Warner basically said, look, if we can't do this, we can't compete. Now, you know, they, they had every incentive to overstate their woes. But I, I do think there's a kernel of truth to it. I think over time and on balance, they're right that this is a significant competitive advantage that they want to access. The real question for me, and it's gonna, if the antitrust agencies get a hold of this, I'm sure they'll start thinking about the, the, the math. And the math is, um, and Jeff mentioned this earlier, I think it's, it's absolutely correct. Um, do the advantages of scale just keep going up and up and up, or at a certain point do you achieve enough scale where you maximize the advantage from being able to understand your audience better? If, if it's that second thing, then we might get a fairly happy result where we get a bunch of large but nonetheless not dominant platforms competing. If the returns to scale just keep going up and up and up, we might not. Mm -hmm. And I think the jury's out on that question in part because um, we don't know what kind of data analysis methods are coming around the corner. Okay, so can I just jump in on this because sure. I think it's fascinating, not just because of the research assistants watching <laughs> university computers, although that's interesting too. Um, it, None I, of that happens, by the way. Okay, just so we're clear. <laughs> I'm yeah. kidding. Yeah. Uh, but so related to that, right? Yeah. Which is how? Like, this is a question. Um, how would antitrust enforcers want to think about the fact that there isn't necessarily a barrier to collecting that kind of audience data? I mean, create a cool offering, 
inherently pornography, like people will come and they will watch it and then you'll get their data and you'll know how to, to what to do with it, I guess. Except there could be a barrier. I mean, if you're thinking about the economies of scale and a barrier to entry, if you, if there's a company, for instance, Google, I mean, they become more and more powerful and more and more uh, attractive to advertisers because they have more data about the consumer. So if you're thinking about uh, the, the, the barriers to entry, there very much is, well, there are account economies to scale, for, of scale of having it, but there very much is a self-reinforcing network effect there. So I think that the more data you have, the higher the barrier that uh, could be presented for another company. The theory of barriers is always interesting, though, because the theory sometimes runs into the facts. So what happened in the adult entertainment industry is super interesting. So the, the, the people who own MindGeek came in, and the first thing they did was they, they kind of flooded the market with pirated content. And then this, the story goes in the industry, this drove down the value of the producers, which then MindGeek got a whole bunch of venture capital and bought up. Right? Now, that happened a while ago. And so what they ended up was this vertically integrated colossus of producers and distributors. They have the leading distributors. They have a lot of leading producers. Um, if it, that, that's been stable for a while. You know? So if there was no barrier to entry, one might imagine another very significant platform doing the same thing without the piracy. But it hasn't happened. Well, that's, just to throw, throw a little focus on, on, on that, what you often find in networked markets, and everybody knows what network effects are, right? Um, uh, that you have somebody in a closely adjoining space who has similar distribution and access to similar data, and they may, may or may not enter. Now, whether that's Netflix or Amazon in the porn space, I know it's not. But uh, um, in theory, I guess what you're saying is entry may be feasible for someone who's not right in the same market segment. Entirely possible. I, I think there are tremendous reputational barriers to entering right. into that particular market. So maybe that doesn't actually work in another market. Maybe another market would be quickly, you know, susceptible to competition by another platform. So I, I, I think this conversation really nicely tees up a very unresolved question around data and one that certainly is having a lot of debate right now, uh, both domestically here in the U.S. but also globally, which is what you know how. Ought antitrust enforcers ought to regard like very large amounts of data and potential sort of network effects that are self-reinforcing, if I could summarize mm -hmm. your, your point. Um, I think that question is an open question, and I would just note that there is a really vigorous debate on both sides of that as to, um, as to whether that is actually an antitrust problem or whether that's just like an interesting feature of some digital markets. Um, we could circle yeah. back to Nancy's issues, <laughs> which could also create some impacts on how we think about those issues, which I think is really interesting and kind of where, where things may be coming together in the data privacy cyberspace and colliding with the competition space. So Nancy, what do you think about that? Well, um, I think it's, it, it might be uh, something to look at, particularly in the case of, and, and I'm wading into antitrust law here, which the place I don't really belong. but. Um, where there's some sort of non-price uh, competition issue. Um, so you might have um, other companies, I'll think of online dating, uh, where you've had uh, Match.com and Tinder and others that, that have seemed to blossom in that space. Um, all of these companies now, their, their access to data, they just need to provide a platform, I guess that would be one difference and hope people show up. Um, but uh, that is a space where once you're there, um, I would imagine people have developed some sort of a network or have some incentive to, to stay uh, and engage um, that might uh, you know, pr pr preclude them from going somewhere else. Um, well, so, so let's, let's pause on that for a minute. The online dating may be an example Audiovisual may be a, an example where, at least in theory, um, privacy could be a vector of competition, where a dating app or a or an audiovisual platform might have a different privacy policy, and use that as a basis for 
uh, acquiring users or keeping users. Um, the, the missing ingredient, it seems, might be transparency, right? How do you, how do you compare, unless you read the terms of service, which nobody seems to do, um, uh, unless you read the terms of service, how do you have the, enough transparency to enable consumers to have, uh, make an informed decision whether privacy is, is a vector of competition? Well, I think that's a really difficult, uh, I think that's a difficult thing to do. And I think that if you look at, uh, we can see it in the search market. For instance, you have DuckDuckGo that has tried to develop a search engine to compete with Google, um, promising that uh, it will not use your data to track you uh, over time and across the internet to serve you advertisements. The only advertisements it will serve you are contextual advertisements based on the search term you input at that moment, whereas Google, as we know, collects data from a whole host of services that it offers. Um, has DuckDuckGo been successful in creating a search engine that attracts as many people as Google's? I don't think so, and I think this perhaps is where we come to, you know, what is the relative strength of privacy as a uh, market differentiator uh, with what is the benefit of data in developing a really superior search algorithm, which is what Google, you know, certainly says it offers by virtue of having all of this data, um, and are other uh, mechanisms needed to, um, you know, create a level playing field on either score? I think is a question. I think uh, look, I think the Google example and the DuckDuckGo is a perfect example of. The, the amount of data and the use of data is entrenching power, but coming back, and the network effect that you get, but coming back to the question of the role of antitrust analysis in this, I don't see, uh, I don't see the issue being particularly different with data. There are some unique characteristics, sure. So large amounts of data can have an impact on market position, barriers to entry, but if you think about whether there's a violation you still have to look at the conduct. And when you look at a lot of the violations, like the EU case against Google, it's really companies that are using data as the ends, not the means. So they're engaging in conduct in order to get more data, because in that sense, it's very much like traditional currency. They can benefit from it. And, but what they're doing is using you know, traditional products, tying perhaps if it is a tie, that can be a whole debate, operating systems to applications, uh, Google you know, tracking perhaps, uh, tying the Android to certain search, but in order to get more data, in order to reinforce their position. So from an antitrust perspective, I think what you would look at would be, is the conduct anti-competitive under traditional analysis? And then the result maybe is, more data, and then you look at whether that results in a consumer harm. Uh, and, and is all of this data and the content that's being presented to you, whether it's by this site or some others, is that a bad thing? Uh, because it's very tailored. And so are you limiting consumer, are you limiting choices? Because you're getting an advertisement tailored only to you. Some people would say, yes, that's a limit of choice. Some people would say that's pretty efficient. And I only want advertisements for the kinds of things I'm shopping for. There's a whole debate about that as well. But I think the antitrust analysis really, there's some unique aspects, but the core questions really don't change. If I could just add to that, um, Karma's talking about antitrust analysis in the conduct space. Um, I think it's uh, sort of well established, at least in merger review, that the antitrust agencies could think of privacy competition to the extent it exists, I'll get back to that in a minute, as a, as a dimension of competition that could be affected by a combination, um, and that there could be a quality or innovation effect that might be cognizable there. They haven't really acted on those theories yet because for the most part, we just don't see that kind of privacy competition happening in the marketplace. And I think what you don't want the antitrust agencies to do is to start inventing competition where it doesn't exist so that they can try to make privacy policy a thing that they're not gonna be really well equipped to do because privacy policy, as the first panel has just explained to us, is a really multi-dimensional, huge policy challenge that requires balancing a whole bunch of other values that are outside of the, mm -hmm. the appropriate sort of north stars for competition, which is competition, consumers, innovation. Absolutely. Let, let, let me 
Let's go a little further with that. You, the, the FTC is an unusual agency in that it has a, an antitrust wing and a privacy wing. Privacy wing is largely in consumer protection. And um, there are those of us who practice there who think sometimes the twain doesn't meet as much as it should, that the, that the, that the bureaus look at the world very differently. Um, I, I think the, the, the question is when you're a commissioner and you're, you're looking, you know, competition can be a means of securing privacy um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a competitive world, one would think it would be, right? Because you'd have firms competing along the lines we were talking about. How do, how do you feel the agency kind of deals with that almost church-state separation yeah. between privacy on the one hand and competition on the other? Okay, well, it's important um, to remember that the FTC is this really interesting agency. It has, on the one hand, the authority to protect uh, consumers and the, uh, from unfair competition, right, unfair competitive practices. It also has authority over mergers that it shares jointly with the DOJ and the antitrust division and, and via its authority in its act, it can reach the Sherman Act conduct violations as well in antitrust law. Um, but on the other hand, it also has this consumer protection mandate, um, and I'm vastly simplifying because there's actually like 37 other laws it enforces on the consumer protection side, but let's put those over here for a second, <laughs> like FICRA and all of that. Um, uh, but it has this other, other responsibility, which is to perfect, protect consumers from unfair, deceptive acts and practices in the marketplace. Um, uh, so the, the so-called UDAP authority. Um, so those are different authorities. And I think um, the consumer protection side of the house thinks in the terms of its UDAP authority, and the competition side of the house thinks in terms of its competition law authority. Um, and there are differences in those frameworks. That is appropriate in my view. Those are also frameworks that also have common law aspects to them, so they've evolved differently in the court system. So actually what, what the authorities are there are, are a little bit different. We see sometimes the, the two sides of the house considering an issue, um, most prominently in um, the Facebook WhatsApp tran transaction where uh, there was this kind of, I wasn't there at the FTC at the time, there was a sort of um, uh, transfer over to the Bureau of Consumer Protection to remind Facebook that it had obligations to tell people clearly if they were going to change the terms of how they were handling their data um, after the transaction. That's a pretty well-established privacy principle, but they sent this letter anyway. It was interesting, um, and it was sort of noted at the time. Occasionally, there have been sales of data, so when Radio Shack, um, for those younger people in the audience, that's a place where people used to go and buy <laughs> radios and telephones and things. Um, it was cool. Um, uh, that went out of business, and uh, they had a very large set of customer data that in the course of bankruptcy they wanted to sell, and so the consumer protection side had to take a look at whether that was sort of permissible under, under the um, terms by which it was collected in the first place, because in, in privacy law, at least as the FTC approaches it in the U.S., you can't retroactively reach back into a pool of data collected under certain terms and change those terms without telling people about it, essentially. You have to notify them. Um, and so we see a little bit of that. Um, we also see agencies, I think, interestingly, around the world looking at the FTC model as maybe the solution to bridge the gap between these consumer protection privacy values and competition frameworks. And like, that's the solution, is put them all under one house. And so we see some other agencies starting to develop that way um, in Korea and other markets. And, uh, and I think there's something interesting there. I guess I, where I come down having sat as a commissioner over both of those houses, sides of the house is that, um, that I, I think it's important for the competition enforcement agencies not to try to make uh, policy consumer protection choices because they're not often very well equipped with the tools that they have to make the right judgment calls there. Um, and that in fact, those are very complicated issues that may be best resolved over here on the other side of the consumer protection house or maybe require new policies and new legislation that are also very complicated and multifaceted. So that, so Chris, the, what Terrell just referred to, I think, is the what antitrust lawyers and others call if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail problem, right? right? right. And we're, we're, we're at a point where, and you, you alluded to this, Chris, in your earlier comments, um, one can imagine uh, 
far more robust uses of data going forward. When we get to the artificial intelligence world, data, of course, is the fuel that powers artificial intelligence. And um, there is a considerable concern and some fear uh, uh, in many quarters about where that could take us. And I guess the question that, that Tara just raised, in essence, is how much is antitrust being asked to address problems that may need to be addressed in other arenas in other ways? Yeah, so my suspicion is antitrust is being asked to do a lot of things that it's never going to be able to do. So, so on this panel, the, the, we, what we don't have is one of the kind of neo-Brandeisian antitrust people who basically think that the scale of the problems is Do you want growing. to tell folks what that so, is? Sorry. Sorry. So, sorry. So the idea that antitrust is kind of resolved, I mean, Terrell gave just now the, the, the kind of the, the dominant view of antitrust and consumer protection being different things, antitrust really resolving to consumer welfare, innovation, competition, right? So there's this kind of neo-Brandeisian perspective that's rising up. Um, I don't know how far it will rise, but it's rising up, and there, there's, there's the notion that antitrust used to be much more political and plural in its values than it became um, after the 1970s. And what we need to do in antitrust is go back to those plural values. So we need to think about the effect of, of uh, changes in market structure on labor. We need to think about the effect on small business. We need to think about the effect, importantly, on our political system. So agglomeration of economic power kind of translates in our system into agglomeration of political power. And antitrust used to be viewed not just as a consumer welfare standard, but as a charter of economic and political freedom. Right. So let's go back to that. The problem with going back to that is it's, it's basically a theory of everything, and it's difficult to do enforcement when you have a theory of everything, right? It's like, well, you just pick and choose without constraint, and that leads to trouble, right? So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough and have been through enough where I am suspicious, I'm skeptical of this, right? But they have a point, and here's how I see the point. So take Amazon. Amazon is in the content business. They're, they are collecting an enormous amount of data uh, how are they doing it? They're, they're taking a bunch of content and they're offering it to you, quote, for free. It's not really free. They're offering it to you as an inducement to sign up for Prime. Now, of course, Prime is a central part of their strategy to become the pervasive retailer of everything, right? Once people sign up for Prime, which is this, you pay once, you get free delivery, people order way more, right? So, and they start replacing other purchases with stuff from Amazon. So this is a, a big vector for them to push deeper into people's lives, and it's, it's working very well. Content, creative content, is one of the way that, ways that they pull people into Prime, video, audio, books. Um, imagine that you know, as this goes forward, Amazon turn, finds out that people's preferences over creative content are actually very useful in predicting their preferences about shovels and you know, <laughs> shoes, um, which I can imagine is actually probably true. And if this is true, um, imagine that they just start to treat the content business as um, a, a kind of investment in all this other stuff. And so they basically just undermine the cost structure of the content business and basically reduce the, 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 the payoff for investing in content unless you have this enormous superstructure of the everything store to basically use as a as a, as a way to capture the value of content. So surely that would be an enormous change in a lot of things that we would be concerned about. Economic power, you know, where creativity comes from, how it gets marketed, right? Diversity and expression. Uh, this would be something we should be very concerned about. I don't think antitrust has the tools to deal with this at all. Like where does antitrust even start? Is this a great story about you know, people getting a lot of content for free? I mean, free sounds great. Or is this a really bad story about you know, um, the choices in where you get your content shrinking. Um, I don't know how antitrust decides that. It's a real puzzle. And since we're sitting at a law school, if I could just jump in with an important aspect that is often lost from the broader policy debate, which I agree is an interesting policy debate, and you summarized it really well. Conventional over here, like new brand Asian over there. Uh, not me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, not, I, not I, I'm reporting. No, you decide. Uh, no, yeah. but like raising important yeah. points that are really yeah. grounded in this larger co like conversation yeah. that's being had about whether there's a concentration problem at the macro level in several industries in the U.S. economy that is persistent and really related to economic inequality that is persistent. Those are important macroeconomic policy problems. Um, and they are real, and I believe in them, 
uh, it's just important not to believe that antitrust law can solve all of those problems or that antitrust under enforcement is related to all of those problems because I think they're, they're bigger than that and they're different and they're macro. Um, and so, totally that. so, so that's the debate that's playing out. It's fascinating. Um, but we're in a law school, so I'll just say uh, the law also really restrains what the antitrust agencies can do because of how the judges have interpreted it. That's cool, we're a common law system, but sometimes the policy debate becomes really unmoored from the actual on the ground reality uh, when, that you're really confronted with when you sit at a law enforcement agency. So I think you, there is, oh, Let, I, let me set yeah. that question to you. I'm about, I'm about to throw it to you. So, so at the end of the day, antitrust, you know, you have to convince a judge that she should take an action against a very powerful interest because antitrust almost always is concerned with very successful firms. The, the, the other case is price fixing. But in the, in, the, in, the, in the conduct case, in the monopolization case, you're dealing with um, the most powerful firms in whatever segment you're talking about. And you're asking a judge to take an action uh, uh, um, to rein in that power. Um, how do you, uh, Microsoft was an example of that. Um, but how today, given the kind of swirl of concerns there are around antitrust, do you, do you see these issues showing up in the courtroom or not showing up in the courtroom for some of the reasons I think Terrell identified? Yeah, so I, I think there is, well, there's a lot in that question, <laughs> but, but I think there is somewhat of an intersection between the privacy issues and the antitrust issues. Well, I agree that you are uh, not going to see, for ex example, me arguing that just the, the fact that a company might have a lot of data and might be huge, that is not an antitrust violation in and of itself. However, if a company is using its position, for example, to coerce uh, to coerce consumers or users to give data in order to sign up for a service that it might not want because that company might be the only choice as a practical matter out there, then that can be an antitrust violation under some circumstances and as well as a privacy issue. So there is an intersection there or the accumulation of data without consent or knowledge. That's a privacy issue. It can also be anti-competitive if it helps entrench a company. So coming back to the question of how to convince a judge, I think you really have to think not just about the size of the company, but the conduct. And that's where you really can assess the intersection between privacy issues and antitrust, and that's where there is some overlap. But it's really about the conduct and what is the company doing with that. So John Baker, who was the chief economist uh, at several agencies, including the FTC, um, last week offered a hypothetical that I think kind of illustrates this point. John said, suppose Amazon, and it's Amazon stay in the barrel, um, suppose Amazon, which has a merchant platform, right? If you are, you know, Blattner Shoes, um, um, and you want to offer your product on uh, Amazon's merchant platform, um, could Amazon, and this is John's hypothetical, um, take that data uh, and use it to offer its own offerings and perhaps discount its own offerings to drive poor Blattner out of the market? But they do that now. <laughs> I mean, that's not... Right, I mean, that's not an exotic example. Well, so, so is there, it, it, I mean, I don't know the answer to this. I, I would certainly want to know, are there internal controls on how they can use that data? And maybe, Nancy, you've got a thought about well, that. Well, I think, you know, from a privacy perspective, certainly their use of the data would have to be disclosed in their privacy policy, um, which I haven't looked at Amazon's privacy policy recently, but it, it might be written very broadly to allow the use of data uh, that it collects from users' interaction with its site for its own internal marketing purposes, which would probably cover what you've just described. Um, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing um, is for consumers to decide, but as far as privacy law in the United States goes, that would be the extent of it if they've satisfied that obligation to make a clear representation about their practices and they adhere to that, 
than it's for consumers. So that's happening. It's happening in New York. So Amazon is growing a very sizable fashion business in New York. And they're doing it in part, I'm sure, by monitoring very closely what trends are selling well on their sites and by knocking off those trends, which is completely legal. And good thing that it is legal. I've written about that. It spurs innovation. But that aside, one of the innovations it spurs is Amazon is using the data that's visible to it about sales on its own site to, um, to f be a fast follower of fashion trends very successfully. And to the extent, and this, this implicates the antitrust debate and how much can antitrust do, because to the extent that one of the things that antitrust is concerned about is lowering prices, then that is a good thing, right? Because all of a sudden you have Jeff Blattner's shoes uh, at, a, at a lower price. So in that sense, you're providing more products, more services at a lower price. Now, the flip side of that is that, you know, some of the shoemakers might be going out of business if they can't beat the Amazon price. So, so I'll, I'll that's throw where out antitrust a... may not. And, and I guess I would just, the one thing I would add, just taking up on the sort of where antitrust law is today and how the courts might interpret it, um, where in a conduct situation, you're looking for those sort of, um, I think of them as like conduct plus factors. Like yeah. what's the extra thing that is like monopolization here? Um, and so in this situation, this hypothetical, maybe it's like predatory pricing or something like that. That's actually pretty hard because how do you separate out what is discounting that is pro-consumer and pro-competitive from what is actually predatory pricing, monopolization? Well, there's this recoupment test Nobody likes it, <laughs> but but at the same time, it's really hard to think about what is the right framework to figure out what what is predatory pricing. So I'll throw out a term that antitrust lawyers should never use in polite company, which is essential facility, <laughs> right? <laughs> which is see, I guess right. So so um, which means is the, you know think of the only bridge that a railroad could take into a town's railroad station. That that's kind of the historic uh, essential facility. So if you're Platinum Shoes, do you have to sell as a practical matter on Amazon's merchant platform? And if you, well, that's, so that's the question, right? Because if you do, then the argument that, that Amazon gets to use the data that my customers generate on your platform, Amazon, the, you know, Amazon's ability to extract that and use it to compete with me, doesn't that seem a little troubling? Yes. It's a leading question. <laughs> it seems a little troubling, but but right. again, it also seems a little great. Yeah. So this is this is like the double-edged <laughs> problem. This is the thing. Like, yeah, this is the thing. It's like I could pick your point because on the one hand, it is troubling <laughs> because it Amazon's. It, it's hard to imagine another everything store, right? It's hard to imagine a competitor coming in that would compete with Amazon on how much are we going to use the data on sales of your product over our platform to compete with you, right? Um, I doubt there's going to be competition on that uh, front. On the other hand, like Amazon is driving down the cost of things so relentlessly, right? So viewed through an antitrust lens, it looks on balance like competition is doing what it does, which is creating a lot of benefit and leaving a lot of wounded people in its wake, and that's the trade-off. Uh, and I just I also like I think it's important. There's a huge assumption in the hypothetical here, which is that you have to, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's like be careful with that because it has a lot of implications. And and I think, uh, you know, I don't know. I'd like to see a lot of evidence of why that would be the case. I think that's right. So once the assumption is that Amazon's the only place in the world that you can possibly sell your shoes, that there aren't other websites or other outlets, now is it what's called an essential facility, like the only bridge to get? to wherever you need to be, very few of those that I know of. And if it is, what does that mean? Does Amazon have to carry every merchant that's out there regardless? Now you're talking about forced sharing, forced sharing data, forced carrying, yeah, right. all sorts of other remedies and, and issues <coughs> come into play there. So <clears throat> under Silicon Flatiron precedence, <laughs> um, the first question is reserved for a student. I will say, um, lest you think law students uh, can't shake the world, that the person who has advanced the most energetic arguments about Amazon 
um, was a Yale law student named Lena Khan. And there's a, there's a profile of her in the New York Times Magazine maybe a month or two ago. You can find it with Bing or Google. Um, <laughs> uh, but but uh, in the spirit of uh, uh, law students shaking up the world, uh, is there a law student who has a question? Yes, Jordan. You mentioned uh, at the beginning that we should factor in exclusive control and the impact on consumers when evaluating the competitive significance of data. And then, Chris, you mentioned at the end here that Amazon is driving down price. But when price has been taken out of the equation by a handful of free uh, internet platforms, how can we meaningfully in, uh, measure the impact on consumers uh, with today's antitrust doctrines? Great question. I think. Something, a couple of things. One, you can look at choices and whether consumers are, for example, getting certain advertisements only uh, tailored to them. Does that limiting choice content? Is content being limited because content providers are only providing a certain kind of content? So you can measure impact and more than just price. The other aspect, and then if you're talking about price, you don't just necessarily look at the price that the consumer is paying directly because some content might be free to consumers. Searches might be free. But then what does that do to the price that advertisers have to pay? So I'm going to pick on Google. For example, Google. We use the services for free, but we know that Google charges advertisers uh, money because it's getting the data. Now, prices for advertising may go up. How does that impact now what, right? Are the advertisers passing along the higher prices for advertisers to consumers in the form of goods? So you don't only look at uh, impact in terms of the price directly that the consumer has to pay, although that's a huge part of it, but it also could be in the, the offerings and the choices that are available. Other questions? Yes, sir. Front. You mentioned at the beginning of the talk that you didn't necessarily think there was a problem, or certainly not an antitrust problem, with uh, companies aggregating larger and larger amounts of data. Um, I would I would ask, you know, the the, the scale of the Equifax breach uh, affected, I think, literally every adult in the U.S. and 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 many people in several other countries, and and certainly that scale of that uh, effect of that breach is directly proportional to the amount of data they had collected. Is there maybe some sort of very blunt antitrust role in simply trying to limit the size of, of some of these aggregators simply from a potential harm perspective in the sense that not that they're doing anything in, in a pure antitrust uh, uh, trust kind of way, but simply that they're, they've put enough data in one place that it becomes a very potential, very big danger. Ah, okay, so I'm going to pet, this goes to the debate, it, it's big, bad, what do you yeah. do with the antitrust laws? So there's, it, when you're talking about antitrust and what it does, there's a big debate about that. I think the word is necessarily there, but why don't why don't you you both no, no, look I, like you're I think it's great. jumping I think to we answer both, this we one. both like inhale <laughs> breath <laughs> like on that. I think we want to be careful about using antitrust law yeah. to draw those kinds of lines. And what you're talking about is actually um, is data policy and privacy policy, data minimization. What are the responsibilities associated with holding that much data, um, and what investments correspond with that, and, and what are your responsibilities? And there. I will say the approach has been a bit of a sliding scale, right? What is reasonable around securing that and holding that in the, uh, uh, properly when you have a very large amount of it goes up when it's a very large amount of data. So when I think about large data pools, I think about pools. And I think about Fletcher versus Rylands, which is a, so I teach torts. And so there you Not have professor. like a large collection of water. <laughs> and it breaks through into a mine underneath the property. Uh, that's owned by an adjoining landowner. And the question is, what's the standard for liability for the collection of large amounts of water? And the court says strict liability, yeah. right? Because it's an unnatural use of the land. So the, 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 re the reasoning is not so great, but I think the principle yeah, might actually be great. Some papers about that. Exactly. So, so if you think about you know, how might we think about regulating large collections of data, we might impose strict liability on them from a tort principle because we expect strict liability will result not just in the taking of precautions, but if you're liable even though you've taken precautions, it will regulate the amount of data you collect. It will, it will 
force the data collector to internalize the social cost of data collection, which I think is partially. Can I make one? You get the last point? word. Um, to your question, Equifax is a, is a great example of, of where even privacy laws might not do enough to contain the damage that you just described, in part because, and Jeff brought this up earlier, the importance of transparency uh, in privacy law um, is it, 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 transparency is a, is a very important principle and allows consumers to hopefully take action to ask that data be deleted or to limit the data uh, that a company collects. Equifax does not have a relation, direct relationship with consumers, and so this was a company that a lot of people didn't even know about and know that had their data. And I think Omer mentioned earlier the new California privacy law that's going into effect will have a private right of action for consumers in the event of a data breach along the lines of what you described. So we're going to see a change coming soon. We are out of time. Let's join me in thanking our panelists for a great conversation. Yeah.